I came across this question in a, a surprising place. It's an academic journal, uh, an article written by a professor in a Welsh university. It's got nothing to do with Wales, though he did ask his students uh, to answer his survey. I won't ask you. Uh, I suspect everybody in the room knows their birth sign today. Anybody not? Not too sure? Okay, a couple. Uh, most people do. I won't ask you how many of you read horoscopes. Uh, it used to be pretty common. Uh, if you uh, ask the group of students that uh, that university lecturer asked, then this is what you get. He says, in one of my groups of mostly male students aged 18 to 21, I found that 70% read a horoscope column once a month and 51% valued its advice, 98% knew their sun sign, 45% thought it described their personalities, 25% said it can make accurate forecasts, and so on. A strange group of Welsh students? No. The higher figures are close to previous research, which showed that 73% of British adults believe in astronomy. That was an article written. You can't see it, but it was written. 2017. So it seems the majority of young people, at least in this country, believe you can tell the future by reading the stars. That's, that's an amazing, amazing thing. So we're going to look at reading the future, not in the stars, but in the scripture. It ought to come as such an extraordinary, surprising concept, given that so many people believe the future might be written somewhere, uh, that it might be communicated to us in some way. Even the uh, sober economist last year, uh, it makes an annual prediction. It brings it this, its prophecy edition at the end of the, a year to predict what's going to happen in the next year. And last year, and I haven't found out how accurate these were, they were particularly impressed with the ability of young people to anticipate what's going to happen in the future to the extent that they call these young people Generation Prophet. Uh, and they asked them to make predictions about what they saw the future, uh, to give their predictions. The truth is, though, we can't ourselves predict the future. Even the sober economist has reviewed its past predictions and said, we got some right, we got some wrong. You can't put any confidence in those predictions. Look, you can't even predict how people will vote in an election in three weeks' time. We know that, that even with all the armies of people canvassing opinion uh, and measuring uh, behavior, these predictions are notoriously wrong. And on a more uh, sad, tragic note, no one predicted the Arab Spring. No one predicted the collapse of ancient civilizations. No one predicted the carnage in Syria. No one predicted that the world's oldest city in continuous habitation would implode in the way it has. It's obvious, isn't it, that we can't predict the future. Uh, and yet, it seems, most young people believe it's somehow written in the stars. And that just shows us the capacity we have to, to be contradictory. Those same young people, I don't think, are showing much interest in the scriptures. But the scriptures put uh, put themselves on the line in being able to predict the future. Isaiah 47, of course, tells us that God has no place for stargazers. He's talking about the Babylonians who were expert in reading the stars and their movements and mapping them. You go to the British Museum, you can see these little clay tablets where the, the course of the cycle of, of the planet movements was recorded, where uh, all sorts of interesting uh, scientific observations being made. But 
Scripture is clear. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, and the monthly prognosticators stand up and say, in other words, you really believe that your future is written in the stars? Go ask them if they can give you salvation. And the answer is, of course, they can't. But, look, in the same section of Scripture, and we're reading this in our daily read, those of us following the Bible Companion will be, uh, well, we read this this morning together, and in the next few days, we'll see this argument repeated. It's just worth having a look at the argument in Isaiah 41, because there, God is calling the nations together. He says to Isaiah, assemble the nations. There's going to be a test. They have their gods, Israel, you have your God. And the test of who is the true God, the test is, can you predict the future? This is God's test to the nations. Look, it says, well, you believe in your gods, Israel has got uh, its God. So bring people together, tell us what's going to happen. Declare to us the things to come. Tell us what is to come hereafter, that we may know that you are God's. That's a pretty reasonable test. Who can predict the future? I'm not talking about Nostradamus-type vague statements, which who knows whether they ever come true or not. It's just a matter of people's imagination to, to conjure up a thought that might say, oh, that fits with, with what Nostradamus says. No, we're talking about really predict the future. God says, get the nations together, like he repeats it in chapter 43, get the nations together, and he said, Israel, the Jews, are my witnesses. In other words, here's a proof for the existence of God, that God himself has said before us, which says, God says, I can predict the future, and I will predict the future of the Jews. They will be my witnesses, and I will put them in the midst of the nations, and all the nations, you bring your evidences for your beliefs together, you'll see which one is true. The amazing thing, of course, today is that in the United Nations General Assembly, where all the nations are gathered together, the Prime Minister of Israel stands up and talks about how they've been back in the land for 70 years, just as their scriptures had foretold. It's an amazing witness to the nations of the world. God is telling them that he exists in a way which is provable beyond any uh, sort of uh, type of proof that men could develop themselves. And we want to look at one of those uh, predictions tonight, not one of the normal ones, I'm sure, in the 70th anniversary of the State of Israel or, or the... Uh, and the anniversary of the Balfour Declaration. Uh, you've heard, be part of, giving talks on the witness of the Jews to the truth of the Bible. Well, this, this one is a bit different. Uh, it's a challenging passage, Daniel chapter 9, but it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful passage of Scripture. When you go back to ancient Babylon, 600 years before the Lord Jesus Christ, that is 2,600 years ago, and read what was written there by the prophet Daniel. Interestingly, there was a time when the, the experts didn't believe Babylon was a real place, had been a real place. They thought it was mythological, until a German explorer called the Bay dug up an ancient mound, and then it found proof. Stones with Nebuchadnezzar's name written on them. Babylon had been discovered. And here are American soldiers camping in ancient Babylon in the Iraq conflict. So it's a real place that really did exist. King Nebuchadnezzar, the man who had the dream of the uh, metallic man, he was a real person. He had his name stamped on the bricks and he had his name stamped on the flagstones on which the streets of Babylon were paved. If you went to uh, Germany, to Berlin, you could see the uh, majestic remains reconstructed, of course, of the Ishtar Gate of ancient Babylon. Quite stunning 
uh, technology available in those days to create such a, a structure out of ceramic glazed brick where these creatures come in 3D relief out of the, the wall. This was magnificent Babylon that the Bible describes and it was Nebuchadnezzar whose dream was interpreted by Daniel who saw the future. He saw the four great world empires coming to uh, the end of their time when the feet of iron and clay were struck by stone cut out without hands. And in that, in that sort of vision of all visions of prophecy, Daniel explained to Nebuchadnezzar that the God of heaven has a plan with this earth, a plan of salvation for every one of us, that the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And it will replace the kingdoms of men that will grow to fill the whole earth. And that's the sort of prediction that the Bible talks about. It's quite specific. It told Daniel that there would be a succession of empires, that after the fourth empire, the kingdom would be divided up into clay. That's not the subject of our talk tonight. You'll know the explanation pretty well. We'd like to go to Daniel chapter 9, because there is a, a prophecy that takes some thinking about. It's called the 70 weeks prophecy because in verse 24, uh, you may want to look at your own Bibles, uh, you may have some notes there which might be helpful. I won't ask you to call them out, but uh, you may want to share them with me afterwards. So verse 24, 70 weeks of Now what's the context? The context in chapter 9, I haven't got it on the screen, is that Daniel is praying. The Jews have been in captivity in Babylon for 70 years. That 70 years has come to an end. And Jeremiah said they'd be there for 70 years. And Jeremiah the prophet was right. They'd been there for 70 years. But then if they turned to God with all their heart and sought him, that they would return to the land. And that's what Daniel is doing. He's in the spirit of Jeremiah's prophecy, he's seeking God, confessing the sins. You can just go through it and see that. Verse 5, we have sinned. Verse 15, we have sins, confessing sins. And he wants God to restore Israel, to fellowship with him. And while Daniel is praying, his prayer is interrupted by an angel, Gabriel, verse 21 tells us. And the answer to Daniel's prayer is now given in this cryptic and interesting form. What Daniel is praying for is what verse 24 says is going to happen. The end of transgression, sins, and iniquity. Daniel is praying for the nation to be forgiven of all those transgressions, sins, and iniquities. And Gabriel, the angel, comes and says, yes, that will happen in 70 weeks. Your prayer, you're going to have to wait 70 weeks. Now, the word weeks is the word for seven, so we're not quite sure at the moment. Seven, uh, 77 watts, that's what we have to find out. But when this event happens, when this time period is finished, everlasting righteousness will be brought in. Something dramatic is going to happen to make an end of sin and bring in everlasting righteousness. Verse 25 says, know therefore and understand. Of course, with hindsight, we know as believers in the New Testament, what event happened to make an end of sin and bring in everlasting righteousness? It's none other than the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is 1 John 1 verse 7. The blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. So the question is, was Daniel actually predicting, after a certain time period, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, who would be a sacrifice to take away the sin of the world? What about this time period that would have to wait? There's a principle in Scripture, which I'm sure everybody uh, who is familiar with Scripture will, will understand. It's called the day for a year principle. It's not a made-up one. It's not a Christadelphian principle. It's not a Christadelphian uh, interpreter's principle. It's a biblical principle. Uh, 
Here are two examples, Numbers chapter 14, verse 34. After the number of the days in which he searched the land, even 40 days, each day for a year shall he bear your iniquities. So that which took 40 days becomes a, a symbol for a 40-year period, a day for a year. Ezekiel chapter 4, verses 4 and 6. I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity according to the number of the days I have appointed thee each day for a year. And so throughout Protestant history, Bible students have looked at these time periods and said, they're not to be taken literally, they're to be taken as representing longer periods of time, a day for a year. So, let's bring that in and test it out, let's see if it works. Let's see what Daniel might have been telling us. So verse 25 says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and to build Jerusalem, unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be. So this period of time starts with a commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem and finishes with Messiah, the Prince. So it was talking about what we believe to be the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who is going to take away sin is the Messiah, the Prince. That period of time, the 490 years, the 70 weeks of years, will culminate in the coming of Messiah. Now it's broken down into three parts, as you can see. So first of all, it says, in verse 25, seven weeks, and then 62 weeks, and then... Verse 26, after the 62 weeks, or the three score and two weeks, after the 62 weeks, shall Messiah be cut off. So Daniel chapter 9 is saying that someone called Messiah is going to come at a set time, which is itemized here, who is going to be cut off, we understand crucified, for the sins <coughs> of the people. And then what's going to happen? Well, Verse 26 tells us that after that happens, the city is going to be destroyed. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. So not only was here a prediction of Messiah coming, but the city of Jerusalem is going to be destroyed and made desolate. Verse 27 gives us a little more detail. So there's a period of seven weeks, 49 years. There's a period of 62 weeks, that is 434 years. And now there's a period of seven years, that is one week, during which Messiah is going to be cut off. It gets even more specific. So at some point over a seven-year period, if you look at verse 27, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Now we understand from the New Testament that means that he would offer himself, rendering redundant all other sacrifices. But it's in the midst of the week, or the half of the week, after three and a half years of confirming the covenant, Messiah would be cut off. Now that's a lot to take in, but it's pretty specific. This isn't gentle. This isn't very, is it? This is absolutely specific. Actually, you could disprove the Bible. If this turns out to be nonsense, if this turns out to be wrong, you could say the Bible is not the Word of God. And what author would ever put their neck on the line in that way? <clears throat> so what we have to try and find out, and this, of course, is what Bible students have struggled with, when was the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem? One writer writing, I found this recently, in 1877, in a journal called Transactions of the Royal Historical Society, at a time when there was a lot of interest in Bible uh, interpretation in this country, the Christadelphians were just beginning to develop momentum uh, in this country. Uh, they were looking at this prophecy. And the writer says there are four different edicts for the commandment to restore 
and build Jerusalem. Well, the first one was not really a commandment to build Jerusalem. It was Cyrus who said they could go back from Persia to Jerusalem. The Darius commandment was a restatement of the Cyrus commandment. So that wasn't, again, to restore and build Jerusalem. There really are only two. And it's this fourth one, which people have always assumed is the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. It comes from Nehemiah. And when we go back to the book of Nehemiah, we realize what the context is. Nehemiah is in Persia, and he has um, a message that Jerusalem is broken down. The walls are broken down, and he's distraught. And he asked the king if he can go back and repair Jerusalem. And we're told it was in the reign of Artaxerxes the king. I'm just using the dates that were given uh, from the normal regular sources. And Artaxerxes in the 20th year of his reign says to Nehemiah that he can go back and build the wall of Jerusalem. So here, I think, without doubt, is a commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. The problem is, it doesn't fit. Now, one, one way around the problem is to, to say that the chronologies are wrong. That if we get the chronologies of the king is right, it must fit. Of course, that's the perspective of a believer. I'm looking at it from the perspective of a skeptic. So, Daniel chapter 9 has sort of been put in the drawer. Uh, doesn't quite fit. Remarkable, talking of Messiah being cut off and so on, but the time periods are a bit, well, we don't put too much store by time periods, do we? After all, no one knows the day and the hour. Let's put it in the drawer. But, you know, there is another and better commandment that fits the bill. Now it's a little bit lost. You'd have to come back to Ezra, the book of Ezra. And in Ezra chapter 7, you find that Ezra, several years before Nehemiah, is uh, going to go back to Jerusalem. And we're told in verse 7 and 8 of Ezra chapter 7 that it's the seventh year of our tax Xerxes, the seventh year of our tax Xerxes. Well, Ezra is allowed to go back, but who says it's to restore and build Jerusalem? So you come to chapter 9, and here is Ezra reflecting on what's happened. He says, We were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God, now look what it says here, and to repair the desolations thereof and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. There was an edict from Artaxerxes in the seventh year of his reign given to Ezra, the scribe, to go up and to restore and to build Jerusalem. So maybe, maybe uh, going to the 20th year might have not been the right one. What about the first commandment? Let's have a look then. But when did Artaxerxes reign? I'm just going by the regular dates. And sometimes it's difficult to know how the dates uh, come into our calendar. You know, it's 457, 457, or is it 458, or is it 456? So you read different books, you might get a, uh, a year, because it depends how you measure the beginning of a reign. You know, our queen has a, an official birthday. So when, when someone says, how long has the queen been reigning? Where do you start? Do you start it formally with a coronation? Do you start it with her, her birthday, official birthday? Do you start it when she actually, when her dad died? You know, when did you start it? So given that plus or minus one year or so, this is what we get. For the 20th year, I said, didn't fit. 
the seventh year of Artaxerxes, four, five, seven, plus or minus one, takes us to AD 34. Now, remember that the last week of this prophecy is divided into two because Messiah will be cut off in the midst of the week. Halfway through the last week, Messiah will be cut off. So Messiah is cut off halfway through the last week. Well, that's, what would you say? Somewhere in the year AD 30. Now, if we're right, the scriptures made a prediction that Messiah would come to make an end of sin, to bring in everlasting <laughs> righteousness, that he would be cut off in AD 30, and after that the city of Jerusalem would be destroyed. The second half of the week is a problem we can come back to. It's not really a problem at all, I think, because there is a, a remarkable point to be made there. So let me ask you, when did the crucifixion take place? When did the Lord Jesus Christ give his life as a sacrifice for the sins of the world? The answer is, no one knows exactly. But let's go to this all-encompassing, all-knowing source, this synopsis of every piece of knowledge ever gathered together by humankind. And they say it was AD 30. Coincidence? What an astonishing thing. What an astonishing thing. But Daniel was given a prophecy of the coming of Messiah, dated and specific. And to the best of, I wouldn't say believers, the best of uh, the world's information, got it spot on. Oh, come on. Who could do that? What writer would even dare to do such a thing? What religion would put its whole credibility on the line on the basis of a falsifiable prediction like that? It was in the reign of Pontius Pilate, who ruled from AD 26 to 36. And what about the last year? The problem is with the last year, if we just go back, nothing particular seems to happen. Well, 2 Peter chapter 3 comes into play. See, in 2 Peter chapter 3, they were saying the time is up and the kingdom hasn't come. Jerusalem was supposed to be destroyed. Jesus himself predicted Jerusalem would be compassed with armies. Daniel chapter 9 said the people of the prince shall come and make the city desolate. And it hasn't happened. We've gone way past AD 34. And 2 Peter chapter 3 says, Count the long suffering of God as salvation. In other words, if God has put off the destruction of Jerusalem to give Jerusalem even more of a chance it doesn't deserve, seize the opportunity. But I tell you, I believe that something very specific did happen in AD 34, which isn't dated in the Acts of the Apostles. And you can get at it this way. Do you know, when was the Apostle Paul converted? When did he see the great light shining from heaven? Well, you can date that within two years because of details given in the Acts of the Apostles and the time periods given in the Acts of the Apostles. And you can work back when the Apostle Paul was converted. It was sometime between AD 34 and AD 36. Which means that the stoning of Stephen, that Paul saw of Tarsus was present, would have been just about there. And from that point, the gospel was pushed out of Jerusalem 
into further lands of freedom. The Lord Jesus Christ, through his apostles, was confirming the covenant for one week. And then Jerusalem's time was up. They did, for nearly 40 years, live on borrowed time. To the point that skeptics thought the end's not going to come. They crammed into Jerusalem, a million of them, believing they had sent the Romans packing. Jesus says, when you see Jerusalem, compassed with armies, then flee to the mountains. The Roman legions withdrew. A faithful few fled to the mountains. The others crammed into Jerusalem. The Romans came back. And Jerusalem was horribly destroyed. Now what, what does the skeptic do with such evidence? Well, what they do with Daniel is this. They say, yes, of course, Daniel was written after these predictions were made. In other words, they weren't real predictions at all. They were pretend predictions. They were fake news. They were written after. And so Daniel chapter 11, which got extraordinary detail of the succession of, of Greek kings through the king of the north, the king of the south, Axis, must have been written. I mean, it's so detailed. It's so, so accurate. It can't have been written ahead of time. Well, is it possible then that Daniel chapter 9 was written after AD 30? A bit unlikely because it's not a Christian book, it's a Hebrew, Aramaic book. And this is where the Dead Sea Scrolls come in. See, the Dead Sea Scrolls, discovered at the time the nation of Israel was being established, 1947, thereabouts, the Dead Sea Scrolls were uncovered in Qumran, near the Dead Sea. Further excavations revealed more and more scrolls, including many fragments of the Book of Daniel, dated at least 150 years B.C. Now, Daniel we're told from the scripture was written 600 years BC. But even if it was only written 150 years BC, would you not think it was remarkable to get a date with the best estimate coinciding? No one believes that Daniel, no skeptic, no, no scholarly skeptic believes that Daniel was written AD 8. Here are fragments from cave number 4 of Daniel chapter 9. Not only that, but Daniel is quoted in sections of the Sibylline oracles, commonly dated to the middle of the 2nd century BC. Daniel was quoted by the Greeks. 200 years before the Lord Jesus Christ. And I found another line of thought here. Bear with me. Uh, some of you may know about Josephus in some detail. But Josephus was a, a first century historian. He was a Jewish uh, soldier who led uh, a corps against the Romans in Galilee, who was then captured and became uh, the historian for the Roman general. It's thought that this may be a bust of the man himself. This is a, a romanticized picture from Christian's translation of Josephus. He was a first century historian. And this is what he said. He said, in the times of Alexander the Great, that's 330 BC, the priest in Jerusalem showed Alexander, a copy of the book of Daniel. And so historians at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ documented that Daniel was understood to have been an ancient book. And this is what Josephus says. He did not only prophesy of future events, as did the other prophets, but he also determined the time of their accomplishment. You can't conceive that Daniel was forged after the crucifixion, when there were 
non-believing historians around talking about the book of Daniel being available to the Greeks hundreds of years before. What, what impressed me was this, that actually Josephus understood the argument that we're making tonight. In fact, he used this argument 2,000 years ago. See, what he says is, all these things this man leave in writing as God has shown them to him, insomuch that such as read his prophecies and see how they've been fulfilled, would wonder at the honour wherewith God honoured Daniel. Now, Daniel's prophecies have been fulfilled and may hence discover how the Epicureans are in error. Who are the Epicureans? The Epicureans were the atheistic evolutionists of his day. And Josephus says, you know the Epicureans who say, they may believe in the existence theoretically of the gods, but the gods have nothing to do with life, did not supervise it, life evolved by random processes, the chance movement of atoms, increasing complexity over time without purpose or design. That's what the Epicureans believe. And Josephus says, you know, the book of Daniel disproves that. So that by the aforementioned predictions of Daniel, those men seem to me very much to err from the truth, who determine that God exercises no providence over human affairs. For it were, if that were the case, that the world went on by mechanical necessity, we should not see that all things would come to pass according to his prophecy. And that's the argument we're trying to make tonight. It's a very powerful one when you think about it. It's not a new argument. The book of Daniel has been speaking eloquently for at least 2,600 years. Daniel chapter 9 saw that Jerusalem would be made desolate. Indeed, Josephus, I think, seems to be making a veiled reference to this. Josephus says that Daniel wrote concerning the Roman government and that our country should be made desolate by them. He seems to be picking up the very words of Daniel chapter 9. Jerusalem was made desolate. The Lord Jesus Christ himself <coughs> said there shall be not one stone left upon another. As you go, since 1967, that Temple Mount has been excavated and there under Robinson's arch are the very stones of the temple that have been thrown down. An amazing witness to the precision of Bible prophecy. The Jews were scattered throughout the world. But then the Lord Jesus Christ said, not forever, only until. Well, we know, don't we, that those prophecies have been coming true during the lifetime of people in this room. I mean, it's fine to me, isn't it? It just is amazing. When, how, what was the percent of people who believed in astrology? What's the percentage of people who believe in the Bible? Single figures, I suspect. <clears throat> what an amazing witness against the world in which we live. Daniel chapter 9, and I know it's not commonly used, you might tell me there are difficulties with it, I think. The difficulties are picking the wrong starting date. If we go to the right starting date, which is Ezra 7 and 9, it absolutely works out beautifully. Ah yes, but what about the last three and a half years? I think that fits excellently as well. The Bible has put itself on the line and God has proved that he can control the future. That's why I think we can't believe these other prophecies. Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. Jesus said it would be until the time of the Gentiles would be fulfilled. And then Jerusalem, Zechariah chapter 12 says, will become the burdensome stone. The last 12 months have seen just that, that the United States of America recognizing through Donald Trump's presidency that Jerusalem is the official unified capital of the state of Israel. 
Jerusalem. The third, I mean, it's amazing. If you've ever seen photographs of Jerusalem from 150 years ago, it was just narrow. It was cholera ridden. It had hardly any population, 10,000, 20,000 people at most. To say that that city, to say 2,000 years, that Jerusalem would become the burdensome stone for all nations of the world. Well, it has become that. And will become more so as the time goes on. Ask the astrologers if they can save you, says Isaiah. Ask the God of Israel if he can save us. Two thousand years ago, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, died to save us and rose to eternal life. He is coming again. There will be a worldwide kingdom. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. If we can have the faith that Daniel is trying to get us to have, if we can hold fast to that faith in these last times, then we have the guarantee that the God of heaven, who can tell the future, can tell our future as well, and will make each one of us part of that glorious time when the Lord Jesus Christ comes.